Young Justice returned again this week with another brand new episode entitled Unknown Factors. I'm Cape Jewel, and by now you should probably know this is the video series where I give my thoughts on the episode, a hunt down any Easter eggs worth noting, and crack a lot of why. So let's not waste any more time, let's get to it. Now, last week the good guys finally clued into the fact that Gretchen Good was not only a regularly evil businesswoman, but she was also the super evil new god and right hand of dark side Granny Goodness. They still seem blissfully ignorant about Glorious Godfrey, but that's a topic for another day. Nightwing makes a grand return this episode, a fact that I know will make my comment section very, very happy. And Dick opts to lead a break and enter mission with Black Lightning while Good is tied up with a big movie premiere. The idea ends up backfiring on them almost instantly and the two end up going missing. Which means in order to save them, Oracle is forced to reach out to Aqualad for help. Of course, this is a sticky situation as Nightwing and Black Lightning were kind to sort of technically breaking the law when they got captured, and now Calder's involvement could also risk dragging the League into some very morally gray waters. A fact that hits our Aquaman very close to home as he's not exactly liking how the team has been conducting themselves recently. Calder will need some backup on this mission, and because at the end of the last episode we met his lover, Wind, he decides to tag along. For those who don't know, Wind actually got his start in the Young Justice tie-in comics. There he was actually a bad guy at first, an Atlantean radical working for Ocean Master. Clearly, he got over it, though. There's definitely something to be said, too, about Calder not wanting to mix business and pleasure at first by having Wynn join him on the surface. After all, he already lost Tula to the superhero life, so it makes sense why he would want to keep his two worlds separate, which, you know, when you think about it and break it down has always been the conflict amongst anyone who wears the Aquaman mantle. But that's not all, because once again, this episode was filled to burst with subplots and side stories. Perhaps the most unexpected, though, involves the return of Mal Duncan and Karen Beecher, aka Guardian and Bumblebee. I totally forgot these two existed, actually, which is a shame, because this hard-working and creative storyline reminds me just how cool they can be. You see, Karen is giving birth to the couple's first child, but there's a problem. The baby was born with a hole in its heart. Not a huge problem. Happens all the time in the real world and is easily fixed, but no surgeon can get through because of a massive snowstorm. This means Karen dons the Bumblebee suit once again and vows to help her child by using her shrinking powers. Here's the thing though, right before Mal and Karen had talked about how they had no metagenes of their own and what it would be like for them as former superheroes raising a kid in a world where people with powers are becoming so very, very prominent. And because Karen has been researching metagene, she does something very morally debatable. She opts to shrink down to her kid's DNA and kickstart their metagene by force. On one hand, yeah, it could very well help the chances of her daughter surviving survival, but on the other hand, that's a huge decision to make for your kid without asking. You can draw about a million real-world parallels between this story and a lot of controversial scientific topics that are going on right now, like gene manipulation, designer babies, and oh yeah, even ew, eugenics. Karen seems to not enjoy what she did, but at the same time feels that she was ultimately right to do it. Now, on the much less heavy front, we also have Cyborg, who is now fully in control over his body and is learning to flex his robo-muscle. Beast Boy is there to tag along too, and it's, you know, a very short scene, but it's fun and nice to see these two heroes with such a long history across media hanging out and getting into shenanigans again here in this show. Back with Aquaman, Calder proves right away why he's such an ideal leader by choosing to forgo the cloak and dagger tactics that got his teammates in trouble and instead just challenge Granny Goodness to her face. It only makes sense, everyone already knows who everyone else is, so to pretend otherwise would just be wasting time at this juncture. It's here we get a better understanding of Granny's pet personal computer and home entertainment system, a creature called Overlord, and oh man, is this a deep 70s comic book cut. Overlord is such an obscure Jack Kirby creation, he doesn't even have his own Wikipedia page, and everything Jack Kirby created has at least a paragraph, I promise you. Now, Granny, being the sick old bird that she is, says Aquaman can have his teammate back if he's willing to go through the X-Pit to get them. What's the X-Pit? Well, much like in the comics, it's a hellish place of torture where Granny breaks the minds, bodies, and souls of people into serving as Darkseid's thralls. Perhaps the pit's most famous alum is actually Mr. Miracle, who I would not be surprised at all if we saw him sooner rather than later. Nightwing and Black Lightning get saved, but now they're unfortunately
absolutely mind slaves, and it's here a massive four-way fight should have taken place, but instead we're once again reminded of the show's budgetary restraints this season, and instead we get a bit of mild wrestling shame, because this could have been a hell of a combat matchup. It also could have been a chance for Carrie Payton to fight Carrie Payton, and wouldn't that have just been a lot of fun? If nothing else, it's around here, though, several seemingly unconnected storylines that have been weaved all season long start intersecting. You see, during the fight, Granny goes after the team's mother box, which in its pain reaches out to Cyborg and Violet, who all share a common bond. The Outsiders assist Aquaman, and Violet uses their healing powers to get Dick and Jefferson back to themselves. At first, I thought they beat Granny rather easily, but then it hit me that she never actually changed forms or publicly blew her cover, and now she can claim that the Outsiders and the Justice League attacked her in her home, and she technically wouldn't be wrong. And finally, we saw some more movement in what I'm calling the Markovian Saga. Dr. Jace once again seems to be trying to mend fences between Breon and Violet, yet if it wasn't made abundantly clear from the beginning, she might very well have ulterior motives, because it's here we finally see her mysterious mentor, and shocker, it turns out to be the ultra-humanite, body-hopping mad scientist, supervillain, and current member of the light. Dun-dun-dun! And so that was unknown factors, and despite the lack of any kind of action scene that I felt this episode deserved, I did end up enjoying it. Particularly the mentally stimulating storyline with Guardian and Bumblebee. Not only do we get to see what it's like for heroes trying to retire and live a normal family life while also feeling the costumed pull, but as the audience we also get asked some very morally complicated questions about how super beings should or should not use their powers with no real answer to be had. Also, after learning Calder was queer in the previous episode, I think it was actually pretty well handled to right after that see him pull a normal mission like he always did with all that Calder charm, almost like the reminding you, hey, he's still every bit the character you love, it's just now you know a little bit more about him. Overall, pretty good show, I felt. 